Hi, y'all. Um, I hope everyone tuning in is staying safe and healthy right now. Um, I'm Caitlin from the Stream Processing Team at Yelp. We're the team that builds and maintains uh, infrastructure to make stream processing with Flink easy and efficient. For those of you who aren't familiar with what Yelp does, we uh, connect people with great local businesses. And one of the ways to strengthen this connection is through providing timely and uh, uh, reliable data so users can stay up to date and businesses trust our service. And that's how we stumbled upon Flink. Um, since the introduction of Flink back in 2017, um, real-time data processing has really taken off at Yelp. Um, as of now, we're running tens of services with thousands of Flink jobs, driving uh, business values of all aspects. And here are some of the examples. Um, data enrichment and transformation as a service. What we offer here is an, an interface where users can perform SQL manipulations in multi-stream and window trace through adding simple config files. Bot detection. Um, it uh, uh, identifies events generated by bot through adding customized filters and machine learning features to provide trustworthy data. We also have a service that helps us understand user behavior through uh, analyzing multi-platform user activity sessions from event logs. And besides that, we also have a connector ecosystem that takes care of streaming between Kafka and all sorts of databases. We also recently introduced Apache Beam, which unlocked Python stream processing and Yelp. Now, each of these platforms goes on to power numerous business use cases. So it won't be pretty if any one of them catches fire. Now, we all know that no, soft, no piece of software is problem free, but there are certainly things we can do to minimize them. And today we're gonna take a, uh, take a look at one of the approaches you can take to uh, safeguard your application. Here's an outline of today's talk. Um, we're going to first go through a uh, Flink acceptance testing framework, aka Flink Compose at Yelp. And then I'm going to share some lessons we've learned. Uh, lastly, we're going to take a look at how state compatibility checking can be done using Flink Compose. So acceptance testing, what is it? Well, according to Wikipedia, it's a test conducted to determine if the requirements of a specification or contract are met. And in the context of uh, computer uh, software development, it uh, often involves orchestrating several services, creating fixture data, and running some type of test driver. And if I'm being completely honest here, um, acceptance testing with streaming services is kind of hard. So why is it so hard? Well, it's simply because there are way too many moving blocks. For example, if you start with a Flink service, it's gonna want to talk to Kafka or some other queuing system to get the events. And besides that, if you want your data to be nicely structured, it's likely you're gonna have a schema registration service. And if we're looking at a connector uh, here, it's gonna want to connect to some sort of database. And on top of that, um, it might also require some other dependencies to run. So what's the solution here? Docker Compose. Docker Compose is a tool for uh, defining and running multi-container Docker applications. And this is how we can provide, provide a uh, sanitized environment to run tests in a repeatable manner without polluting production traffic. But it's not quite Docker Compose. We call it a Flink Compose. It's built on top of Yelp Compose, which provides better integration with Yelp infrastructure. Um, it, also, it also comes with a set of libraries that takes care of common tasks. And it's also been proven to be a great way to verify the correctness of the applications. And by providing a unified testing framework, we were able to significantly lower the overhead across applications. And here is how it works under the hood. Um, the Flink Compose Sandbox is going to take care of spinning up a uh, Flink standalone cluster together with some dependencies we've mentioned before. The test script is then going to submit the job to the cluster uh, while writing some fixture data to the input test stream. 
the Flink job will then pick up the data, do some processing, and writes it back to Kafka. And as the last step, the test script will uh, tail the output and verify if the result matches expectation. Even though this sounds pretty straightforward, building Flink Compose was by no means an easy journey. So let me share some of the lessons we've learned along the way, and hopefully you don't trip over the same pitfalls. Lesson one is about ordering of operations. Um, so in the ideal world, your test will write to Kafka, Flink app will then do some processing, and as the last step, it will uh, read from Kafka and do some verification. But in the real world, even the simplest assumption doesn't hold true all the time. For example, you might have three happening before one, in which case you'll get no data. Or three might happen before two gets to finish, um, in which case um, you get partial output. So it's really important that you make sure the assumption of ordering is met at all times. Lesson two is about event time. Um, I prepared a brain teaser for you guys, so let's have some fun. Um, what we have here is a Flink SQL query that counts the number of reviews for a specific BIS ID over a two minute non overlapping window. We define the event time here to be the timestamp associated with the message, and we set max out of orderness to be 30 seconds. Now let's take a detailed look at the input messages. The first message comes in with BIS ID 1, review ID 1, timestamp 35. And the second message has BIS ID 2, review ID 2, time 65. Then comes the third message with 1395 and 14125. So, what do you guys think the result would be in this case? Let me actually start a poll so uh, to gather some ideas. Um, to add some, uh, to add to some of the background knowledge here. Um, since we didn't define the offset of the windows, they're going to start at 0, 120, 240, 360, and so on. And max out of orderness is used when uh, calculating watermark. Um, the current watermark uh, will equal to the highest timestamp we've seen so far, minus the max, time, uh, max out of orderness. And now it's a treat for you guys to see the admin page of the conference. Let me start the poll. You should see a pop up right about now. I'm going to wait some time before I reveal the answer. Huh, quite interesting. I see about equal ratio of each option. And let's take a look at what's happening inside. Sorry about the technical issue. Uh, we weren't able to load the animation through a uh, big marker. So I'm just sharing my slides now. Um, and the result of this uh, uh, query is actually we're going to get no output. And here's the reason. So we have the timeline here together with the heap that stores all the intermediate results. Uh, message one comes in, and it's going to uh, take us to watermark of five, which you can deduct by subtracting 30 from 35. It's also going to generate a um, Intermediate result uh, saying that in window from 0 to 120, this ID 1 has one review. And then comes the second message, which will advance the watermark to 35, generate another uh, intermediate result for this ID 2 in the same window. And then the third uh, message will uh, further uh, push the watermark to 65 and update the first intermediate result for this ID 1. And then here is the last message, uh, which will give us a watermark of 95 
uh, and generate uh, a new result for biz ID 1 in the next window. Notice that the current watermark here is 95, which isn't enough to close any of the existing windows. And that's exactly why we're going to get no result for this set of input messages. But if we actually set the timestamp of the last message to 155, uh, we're going to get watermark of 125, which is actually going to close the first window from 0 to 120. And that's how you get, get the result from uh, the second option of the poll. All right. So the lesson here is really that you need to be very careful with watermark manipulation, especially dealing with event time. Lesson three is about processing time. Uh, we have the exact same query here um, and the exact same set of input messages. So what do you guys think the result would be right now? Let me also go back and start the next poll. You should see the pop-up right about now. I see the majority of votes is going to the second option. And aha, uh -huh, I got you guys. So the answer here is actually option three, um, meaning I don't know what the result of this query would be. I really don't, because there's no way for me to tell when Flink is going to see the messages, since it completely depends on when you start your tests. For example, um, a, the start of the window can simply fall here, in which case you get uh, the, the last three messages will get grouped into one window, leaving the first one by itself, or it can very well start from here, um, in which case you get a completely different result uh, from the first one. So to get a deterministic result uh, for processing time, the best you can do is to wait till start the window to produce. And here are some of other best practices that we also recommend you guys to follow. Um, the first one is to run your test in parallel. This is gonna save you a tremendous amount of time, especially during development. The second one is to publish common testing images, especially for shared infrastructure like Kafka and schema registration. The third one is to generalize common functionalities such as setting up consumer and producer or uh, schema registration. We also have a Flink client lib that takes care of interaction with the Flink cluster through REST API. We found this to be a great way to accommodate for uh, uh, future version upgrades, since instead of uh, changing the test scripts all over the place, you can just update the endpoint of the REST API in the Flink client lib. And uh, for uh, stateful uh, applications, there is yet another dimension that we care about, which is whether uh, my application can successfully resume from the save point after I switch to a new version of my application. Since we're running on Flink 1.6, so without much control over what gets stored in the state, um, it's very hard for us to reason about whether a change is going to break state compatibility sometimes. Um, so it's also very important for us to come up uh, with a mechanism to catch such unexpected changes. Thanks to Flink Compose, this is as easy as adding another test. So in your test script, uh, you will submit job one with version one of the service. Then you're going to cancel the job with save point. Um, and later on, you will uh, submit job two with version two of the service while trying to resume from the taken state point. And as the last step, you will check for potential issues for state restoration. This is extremely powerful when integrated with a CI CD pipeline. 
um, as you can tell, on March 17, someone pushed a bad change that broke Flink state check. Later on, the nightly build, as well as further changes, were blocked from going to production um, until someone either comes to fix the issue or manually click uh, on the proceed button to resume the pipeline. Notice that we did leave an option to resume the pipeline uh, since, um, say, incompatible changes are sometimes inevitable, but this won't uh, get automatically deployed uh, without any human intervention. So looking forward, uh, we will try to provide a better test template generation, which will further shrink down the development time. We'll also try to automate test message generation, which will be very uh, beneficial uh, in the cases where you have uh, lots of fields in your uh, payload data, but you only care about a very small subset of them. We'll also try to ensure that every state stateful service is guarded by compatibility check. And lastly, to save the uh, to uh, resolve the state migration issue once and for all, we're going to leverage state API starting from Flink 1.9. And with that, I'm going to open up to questions.